Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Nicole Kramer and I am the Programming and Partnerships Manager here at Memorial Hall Library. And I would like to welcome you all to today's presentation. Um, I have turned on automatic captioning, which you can adjust with your Zoom controls if you would like. Um, if you have any questions throughout today's presentation, uh, you may put them in the Q&A and we'll address them at the end. Um, the chat is also available if you have any comments or things you would like to share. Um, and this presentation will be recorded and it will be available on the library's website after the event. Um, I would like to thank the Addison Gallery of American Art for partnering with us for this program. Um, the Addison Gallery is located on the campus of Phillips Academy right here in Andover. Um, the museum is free and open to the public and they are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sundays from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Um, after today's presentation, I encourage you all to visit the museum to see the exhibit in person. Um, it will be on display uh, through the end of the month until December 31st. Today we have Gordon Wilkins, the Robert M. Walker Curator of American Art here with us to take us through some of the treasures in this current exhibit, Rosamond Purcell, Nature Stands Aside. Um, this exhibition is Purcell's first retrospective and reflects the breadth of the artist's career from the late 1960s to the current day. Um, so Gordon, thank you so much for joining us to share this amazing exhibit. Um, I will now turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. And I'm just now sharing my screen and hopefully everyone can see it. Um, again, thank you so much. I'm happy very happy to be here as always. Part We love partnering with the Memorial Hall Library. Um, so today we're going to talk about Rosamond Purcell, Nature Stands Aside, which is an exhibition uh, that's been up since September 1st here at the Addison. And shockingly and unfortunately we'll be closing um, on December 31st. So there are, you have about a two week window to see the show. And I really urge you to come and see the show because these images that I'm about to share um, can't really do the show justice. And it's kind of odd to think about that, particularly when you're when you're thinking of a photography show, but Purcell's work is so rich and uh, detailed and textural that something is almost lost in digital repl replication of the images. You really need to see the actual prints um, and of course the three-dimensional work uh, in person in order to really appreciate um, the incredible virtuosity of her practice. So we're starting right here at the at the beginning and, and this presentation will bring you through the entire show. Of course, I'm not going to talk on, I'll talk about every single image. There are I, allegedly 250, although I don't know, I find that hard to believe, but that's what somebody told me. I, You can see I sort of went a little overboard, but her work is uh, certainly maximalist, not minimalist. So you do need to sort of see the full scope. Um, so I'm not going to go through everything, but giving I'll, I'll be giving you guys sort of the, the high level overview. Um, and again, please don't hesitate to put in um, questions, which I'm happy to address um, at the end of the um, presentation. So the exhibition starts with a, a larger than life size blow up of this wonderful photograph um, taken by Rosamond's husband, uh, Dennis Purcell, who is himself a very gifted photographer. He's an optical engineer and was really instrumental in, in getting the show together. We wouldn't have been able to do the show or the book without him, quite, quite frankly. Um, so this is a photograph that he took of Rosamond. It's not a staged photograph. Rosamond was standing on top of this Hudson and abandoned field um, in Northern New England. Uh, but what she was doing, um, she wasn't just standing there for fun, she was working. Um, and when you zoom in on the, um, I, well, first of all, I'll, I just thought it was a fun comparison. There's, you'll notice there's a through line of cars throughout this exhibition and metal, and also the effects of nature and natural forces on metal, um, and the the ways that way that metal can transform under certain environmental conditions. So rust, decay, those are constant sort of themes and and um, items of interest or areas of interest for Purcell. Uh, here you have an image of her that's fantastic from when she was about eight years old. She she just turned 80. Um, I'm not speaking out of school here. She was born in 1942, so she just celebrated her 80th birthday. Um, and this is a photograph of her. She was born Rosamond Wolf. Uh, Purcell is her married name. She was 
she grew up in Cambridge, um, the, the daughter of um, a very academically minded family. Her father was a, a noted professor of the history of the Balkans and the Byzantine Empire, and also a prolific collector um, at Harvard and a prolific collector of Victorian triple decker uh, novels. And his collection was so vast that it was acquired by the Ransom Center at UT Austin in his, uh, upon his death. Um, and these are, you know, it's one of the most significant collections of Victorian literature and in pristine collections. So think about how she grew up surrounded by pristinely preserved, perfectly cataloged books as we go on and see images and physical books that have been images of an actual physical books that have been transformed uh, and ravaged by time. There's a little bit of a Freudian connection there, but um, that's that's not for me to uh, tease out. But here she is as a child. She's written wash or this car is dusty um, on a Plymouth in her neighborhood. And there she is about 20 years later, standing on top of the, the roof of a car. But again, she's not just posing, she's working and you can see her Polaroid pack camera in her hand. And um, what she also is holding is, um, a peel apart, the peel apart sheet. Uh, Polaroid, which we think of, we when we think of Polaroid, or at least um, generations who didn't necessarily grow up with Polaroid as as um, as something that's kind of more than a novelty, which it is sort of to today's generations. We think of um, the Polaroid that you that shoots out of the camera, SX seventy style film that you you're not really supposed to shake it, but you shake the Polaroid and it develops. This, the Polaroid that Rosman worked with in her early career, and I should mention now that she started with Polaroid. She didn't start in the darkroom as most artists who would later adopt Polaroid technologies did. She didn't even train to be a photographer. She trained, um, she didn't train to be an artist. She went to Boston University and majored in literature and French um, and didn't think she would become an artist or photographer whatsoever. And it was actually because she was handed a Polaroid camera by her husband, or actually then boyfriend, later husband, Dennis, um, back in the um, 1930s, sorry, my colleague who should know that I'm on a call right now is calling me. Um, it wasn't until she was handed a camera before she went on vacation in the 1960s um, to take travel photos that she actually really picked up a camera and she was a natural and it really just took a few lessons in composition and she was off. Um, so here she is. I've taken a circuitous route to get to this photo. Um, here she is holding a Polaroid, um, which was peel apart. So you would have, um, you would take the, the image and then it would go through these rollers, which would basically break this die pack, which had the negative in it. And the you would peel it apart. You would have a print on one side and this thing that you would discard typically uh, on the other side. Um, so she's holding what you would typically discard. And there are prints uh, littering at the bottom uh, on top of the car. So she's very much at work. And the kinds of prints that she was making early on um, are very intimately scaled black and white Polaroids. They're only about two by three inches um, and they're one of a kind. Uh, the Polaroid, this particular film and process she was working with did not have a workable negative. Um, so these are truly one of a kind images. The only way that you can duplicate them is to re-photograph a, a photo the photograph. Even if you were taking, you know, thinking of, of photography, we often think of uniformity and easily easy reproduction of photographic media. Polaroid had really a mind of its own and, and no two batches of Polaroid film were ever exactly alike. So you could take the same shot, make two exposures of the same shot, but there was no guaranteed guarantee that you would get the same print both times. So these are truly precious. Um, and these are, you can see her fascination really early on with certain themes that would carry through. And she really states that kind of manifesto or establishes her, or kind of articulates her, her own photographic manifesto really early on. Um, and so she went from 1968, 69, never really having taken photographs seriously to 1975. So six years later, she had her very first photograph collection of her photographs published, um, which is a pretty remarkable <laughs> rise in a brief period of time. Um, and she is um, working, this This is a book of all Polaroid prints published by David Godin. It was his first sort of monographic photography book. Um, and she, um, in the, her introduction to this um, remarkable early collection, 
she talks about the sequences that she um, puts together in the photographs. And she says, in bringing these photographs into pairs and then into short sequences, several themes emerged. Although I have no conscious metaphorical or symbolic intentions, and although each picture was taken for its own sake with no other in mind, there are recurring ideas which do intrigue me. I'm interested in illusion and camouflage and spaces between shapes and between photographs and double portraiture and in ambiguity. And I would really urge you to think about those themes that she lays out in 1975, uh, where she's talking about camouflage. She's talking about spaces between uh, between shapes and photographs and double portraiture, and really first and foremost in ambiguity. Even though that comes last in the list, this theme of ambiguity, um, if you can consider it a theme, carries through in her work. She's interested also really in doubling and the collapsing of background and foreground. And this is one of her very early photographs and one of the first photographs that she really considers to be successful in expressing her own vision, uh, unique vision as a photographer. So um, this is a photograph at, at its most basic level of a large paper mache mermaid. I mean, I say life size, although mermaids aren't real, um, but you can think of a human scale. It's larger than human scale. Um, and it was in a shop window in Jamaica Plain in Boston, um, and she thought it was quite a fascinating object, so she wanted to take a picture of it. And it was when she took the picture and had the almost instantaneous print, which is another reason why she loved Polaroid, is she likes working from print to print. She doesn't like the sort of anxiety of having to wait to develop your film, then print it in the dark room. She wants to know what she has right away, and she's not... Um, the kind of photographer who's obsessed with cameras and the technology. She doesn't really care if she's using a Hasselblad or a Nikon. She wants to find the medium, the media, the, the equipment that can uh, facilitate the expression of her mind and what she sees in her mind. She wants to find something that will translate her inner vision into uh, an external permanent kind of uh, souvenir of what she's seeing. And so she took this photograph and she noticed that while she thought she was taking a photograph of just the mermaid, she was actually taking a photograph of what was in front of her and what was behind her simultaneously. And glass is a major theme or a major recurring motif in her work. And it's this reflective quality and magical quality of glass that she returns to and, and has returned to over and over again for 50 years. And you'll see later on, and remember to think about glass as we move on, because glass reappears. So she was very successful in this photograph of collapse, collapsing the foreground and background and creating something that is not exactly how you would experience it in real life, but it's something uniquely photographic um, and also ambiguous, unusual. It takes you a while. She likes to take photographs that are on their surface, um, simple or straightforward, but with a quirk, as she would say. Um, this is a, an image of two on the left of two um, wheat pasted posters that have been placed next to each other. And she's kind of taking this very close up shot of this um, du doubling where it looks almost like it's this strangely deep, unfamiliar uh, conjoined twin almost. Um, and the theme of conjoined twins of doubling will continue on in her work. Um, and it's paired in the book and in the exhibition with this really um, humorous, humor is also a, a theme that people don't typically pick up on in her work, but I think if you have a, an open enough mind, you'll find it. Um, here she smashed a commemorative ladybird and LBJ plate and layered the fragments so that again, you have these, here you have two eyes that are too close together on the left and eyes that are too far apart on the right. And again, defamiliarizing and in a way re-enchanting the world. So we know her best as a color photographer, but color was not something that came uh, naturally to her or something that she necessarily thought that she wanted to work in. Of course, um, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, um, you started to see the emergence because of artists like Rosamund Purcell, uh, William Eggleston, um, and others, um, the emergence of color photography as a serious medium of photography. Before this moment, color photography was really seen as um, something for amateurs, not a serious art form necessarily. Um, and I think she was sort of steeped in that, um, that kind of poo-pooing of, 
of color photography and would have been content to work with black and white had she not made this discovery. And again, going back to the theme of chemical reactions of natural effects on, on man-made objects, the image that you see um, on the screen, the thinnest layer, started off as a black and white Polaroid photograph of a human model. And you're not going to see live humans very much from this point on. She, um, around this time, around the late 1970s into the early 80s, she started to tire of working with models. She found it exploitative. She didn't like bossing her friends around, telling them how to pose. So she um, abandons live humans. Um, I won't say humans entirely because you'll see some skeletal remains of humans later on. Uh, but she starts to go in a different direction. And this is really uh, the linchpin, this photograph, where she took a photograph that she didn't think was that great. It was underexposed. She didn't code it, which you really have to do with these types of Polaroids. And she just sort of left it out in her studio under a skylight. And she returned to it one day and she noticed that it had silvered. The silver uh, in the Polaroid had had kind of um, clumped together and uh, and you could see that the surface was reflective because of that metallic sheen. And she held it up to the skylight and she noticed that if she tipped the photograph in the right direction, uh, it would turn red. And so that was just this breakthrough. She's really an alchemist at heart and loves when she can make discoveries through purely analog means. So this is, again, this is before Photoshop, what you're about to see as well. And she decided to take a photograph of it using Polaroid color film. So she adopted color to take a photograph of a turned black and white Polaroid. So again, thinking about these, this kind of Rube, uh, uh, Rube Goldberg, that's the right, yeah, Rube Goldberg machine in her head going through and finding all of these ways to connect things um, and getting at something that for some people might have been of just a very deliberate action of I'm going to try color now, but coming through it in this way, I think is really um, quite poignant and emblematic of how she works. This and the works, a lot of the works that we're about to see um, was published in a 1980 book also by David Godin called Half-Life. And this was her first collection of color photographs. And actually the last truly monographic uh, uh, publication that Rosamond had until we publish our catalog this year. So this was 1980. It would take about 42 years for another um, purely kind of photographic book um, to come out. So she um, also had access to Polaroid materials and slightly more access than the normal photographer. She was brought into the Polaroid Artist Support Program quite early on, and she was given um, uh, new materials to try in exchange for prints. So Polaroid, the Polaroid Corporation maintained its own collection of Polaroid photographs. Um, her husband, uh, Dennis, also worked at Polaroid as an advertising photographer, and he was able to bring home things for her to try. So I think it was because she didn't have the sort of um, financial consideration of having to pay for the material herself, which it was quite expensive, um, she was able to to be extraordinarily exper excuse me, experimental with the medium and do things that other artists weren't, um, including transfer printing. And I mentioned that there was a peel apart and there was a sheet that you would discard typically, but it had dye on it. And you could, she figured out a way to print it by transferring it onto rice paper, watercolor paper. And then she would often re-photograph those transfer prints. And so this is one of her sort of most iconic transfer prints. Um, and this is a photograph of, of her contemporary and, and dear friend, Olivia Parker, um, who is a, another really remarkable Boston area photographer who had a, a retrospective at the Peabody Essex Museum um, in the last five years. And she's sitting here with a bowl of pears. So this is the color that you see that's not anything to do with Photoshop, but to do with trying to transfer and kind of break down this process, see how far it can go and what kind of impacts or effects you can have. She's also doing things like shooting through mylar sheets to get optical distortion. Again, she likes distortion, camouflage, ambiguity. Um, these are actually two self-portraits, although it's hard to, to tell. Um, in both cases, um, the portrait on the right is a photograph. It is not a watercolor. Um, and I think it's even more watercolor-like in person. And again, that that those sort of unusual color, the unusual color palette is caused by the transfer process. 
she's also starting to um, work uh, on things that really have no connection to the outside world. This is a time when the, the so-called directorial mode of photography was in vogue, where photographers weren't going necessarily outside the studio to find inspiration, but were instead working in the studio to construct um, tableaus, to pose models, to really create photographs out of thin air rather than going to, you know, for example, Yosemite as Ansel Adams would to find the perfect shot. They would create it themselves. And she started um, working on a series of, of images of these sort of hybrid cryptozoological humanoid creatures. And back to glass, she made these um, pure, through purely analog means by collecting ambrotypes. And ambrotypes are 19th century um, photographs on glass plates. So they have a translucence to them that's quite remarkable. And she took full advantage of that quality. And she would actually take, um, take uh, tools and scrape away the emulsion. The emulsion is on the back. What you see, if you see a, an amber type in a case, for example, what you're seeing is a layer of glass that is protecting the a coated emulsion on the back. And so she would take the emulsion layer and manipulate it in order to allow light to come through. And so what she would then do is she would take these glass plates and layer them on top of found photographs, stickers, um, Victorian children's stickers. And then she would photograph um, this kind of composite sandwich. And again, collapsing foreground and background, these remarkable images would appear of these hybrid monkey human um, creatures. And again, if you think of this trajectory of, of her work where she's working very early on with live models, here she's sort of, this is a in-between point where she's still interested in the human form, but she's slowly veering into what would become her signature, which is natural history photography. And she's also very interested in evolution at this time. She made a lot of these uh, photographs when she was pregnant with her second son. And so this was work that could be done at home not with large format cameras, she could do this on a very intimate scale. She also um, began to, to make images that really expressed emotional states or states of being kind of psychic concerns. The, this is a, a really wonderful photograph of, of an amber type, which we actually have the exact amber type that Rosman used to make this image on view in the, in the show, where she um, then found this bright red uh, paper on the street um, that had fallen off of a billboard. And it was this deep red. And she decided to layer the, the amber type, which had these um, scratches on, the, on it. And the red bleeds through the surface and looks almost like veins. And so they're veins connecting um, the violin player to his instrument. So it, at this time in the late 1970s into the early 1980s, she was at sort of a, a crossroads where she had been making work uh, that was very successful. She received her first show in, in the 70s uh, at the invitation of Minor White. She participated in a number of Ansel Adams workshops. She was really part of the in crowd in photography. Um, and she kind of deliberately parted ways where she could have, I think, continued a career and been a more conventionally successful fine arts photographer. But she was motivated by her own personal vision as she has always been and has never sacrificed her own vision for the market, for the art world, for museums. Um, and so she decided to do something very different, and that was to start working in natural history collections. As I mentioned, she grew up in Cambridge, and she grew up going to the Museum of Natural History at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard, and she hated the place. She had um, nightmares of the taxidermied beasts, you know, coming alive, and she remembers staring down this kind of endless black hole of a of a open hippo mouth. Um, and so she knew that this was a place that didn't conjure positive memories, but because of that, she knew that it would be a place that would challenge her. And so she began to work in the public facing areas of the museum. And so you can imagine her taking photographs with school groups behind her. She was not given any sort of special access at this time. She had to come during, you know, open hours and she photographed things that were on view. So this photograph on the left of the gorilla, which has this, um, almost disturbing quality as though you're looking at um, perhaps, you know, a man hanging. Um, 
she took this of a uh, of a gorilla specimen hanging in a in a case in a display case. Um, these monkeys were on display that she made this wonderful transfer print of, and it took her quite some time to get access to what she really wanted, which was what the museum doesn't want you to see. And that's the material in the back rooms. Um, and they don't want you to see it for various reasons. Um, usually it's you put your best foot forward and you put your sort of best things on view and you, you hide the things that are maybe damaged, need conservation work, are not as important as what you deem important enough to show. And this was a very kind of sacred space that had not been open to women for very long, and it's certainly not been open to non-scientists. Uh, Rosamond is both. Um, and a woman artist in the early 80s uh, with no science background, no formal science background, trying to get into the back of back rooms of uh, the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Harvard's a wonderful institution. It's not a welcoming institution uh, by any means. So she had to fight. And all of the artists who have followed, who have done work in natural history collections, owe her an immense debt of uh, gratitude because she broke down these doors. There was no really such thing as, a, as an artist, a fine artist, working embedded in the back rooms of a natural history museum before Rosamond Purcell. Um, and so she's also one of our most important institutional critique artists, which is another kind of uh, avenue that I could have gone on in this show. Um, but it was because of another woman, the collections manager um, captured here in this really uh, enigmatic, wonderful portrait um, that kind of slowly allowed her into the back rooms as long as she followed the rules. Um, and part of that was that she had to keep careful notes and you still have to do this every time you go there, you have to fill out a form each photograph for each photograph you take so she had to um, follow the rules of the scientists who worked there and she would take you know these cards, she would fill out the accession numbers, the speed the scientific name of the species. Um, and she had to hold on to these cards and turn them in and document exactly what she was photographing. And But she began to really dig deep. And what was most intriguing to her were the specimens that had been overlooked. Um, you know, this is truly the kingdom of death. Uh, and it just imagines hundreds of thousands, if not millions of specimens um, stored away in cabinets and metal drawers. And she was poking and prodding and bringing things out that had probably not seen the light of day in decades. And she had to be very careful to make sure that she didn't take any tags off. The woman in the photo before her, before this slide said, you know, a monkey, uh, a tag, a monkey without a tag is worthless. A tag is, is important. So it's really, you know, if you have a monkey specimen without a tag, it means nothing. It's just a monkey specimen, but the tag, that data makes it important. And it's this conversion of specimens into data that is something that Rosamond has really interrogated. So this is a notebook that she took uh, notes in while she was working at the museum. Um, she began to stage these tableaus, and these are not elaborate tableaus. Nothing about her practice is sort of overbearing. She doesn't go into spaces and throw her weight around. She likes to do these subtle interventions um, where she will array or arrange these specimens in a way that is compelling to her. And so she was thinking about medieval villagers um, looking up and seeing a comet in the sky when she took these photographs. Um, and she was using a, a type 105 Polaroid film, which gave you a working negative. Um, and so she printed this both, she printed both a positive and a negative of this uh, image. And again, thinking about experimentation and the different um, valences of each photograph, it's quite remarkable um, how one photograph can can give such a different impression um, when it's printed in a different way. She was kind of formally brought into the inner circle of, of the MCZ when she was invited in 1984 to photograph bats for an exhibition of bats at the MCZ. And before then, she thought that she was really a photographer of monkeys. And if we go back to this whole sort of evolution, literal and figurative, of Rosamond's career, where she's starting with humans, she's kind of going back into the ape family and she's photographing monkeys, which she'll never stop photographing monkeys, but she starts to photograph bats and she realizes that she can do more than monkeys. And this opens up a whole world of possibilities, which we'll pick back up on that thread a bit later on. Um, in the early 1980s, she was also invited to work with Polaroid's 20 by 24 camera, which is a massive 
stationary camera it is so huge that it doesn't really travel to it you travel travel to you you travel to it and it was a an honor to be invited everyone from Andy Warhol to William Wegman participated in this 20 by 24 program and you would basically be invited to, or summoned to Cambridge to the to the Polaroid office and Rosman was so um concerned about having to perform in front of this very expensive camera, having to come up with something on the spot with, you know, a camera technician watching and a studio assistant watching, that she started to make things in advance to bring into photographs. So she, by this time, had begun her decades-long excavation of the junkyard at Owl's Head and had found uh, a number of these window uh, frames that she then brought back and would fill with found photographs, with objects, um, with natural history specimens um, and create these windows that she would then bring and photograph on 20 by 24 film. And they were not, the actual three-dimensional window was not um, intended to survive as a work of art in and of itself. Eventually she realized that these windows were extraordinarily compelling and should survive as construction. So she begins a collage practice and a construction practice around this time. This is, um, they're also extraordinarily evocative images. This is called Crystal Knocked, of course, conjuring the, the, the horrors of, of the Holocaust um, with broken glass. But she's also, again, playing with ambiguity where this photograph in the sort of lower right quadrant almost looks like JFK. And then you have what could be bullet holes with red paint that looks like blood. So the associations are endless. And that's again why you really need to see these photographs in person because you can truly get lost in them. It's also making more abstract work. This is a window just with broken glass. So she's a master of texture and color. I mean, this is deceptively simple, um, but the amount of thought and time and skill that goes into crafting these three-dimensional objects that were meant to be collapsed into three-dimensional space uh, is quite remarkable. Of course, she still had to bring in monkeys and she, she was able actually by this point in her relationship to um, bring some of her favorite specimens from the museum in suitcases to the Polaroid office. So um, she was once stopped on an elevator carrying these heavy suitcases and someone, a passenger asked her if she was carrying corpses and she was. She, they of course thought she was make, they were making a joke that she had a human body, but she had you know probably a few gibbons in there. Um, so these are two monkeys. And I think here you really start to see what is so powerful about her work, which is this, and it and it all is sort of distilled in this phrase that is so brilliant that she came up with, and I always butcher, but I wrote down, where she talks about this split second reanimating clarity of purpose. And that idea of these object, these once living beings that we have kind of stripped of all individuality or not personhood, but, uh, you know, these these animals that had their own lives and lived in faraway places have been uh, desecrated and ravaged by humans. You know, of course, they're all killed in order to enter the collection. You can't get into the collection unless you're dead. But then you look particularly at this image of the monkey throwing the ball, um, ripped apart and sewed, sewn back together in a, in a really uh, in a really rough way. So you see the scars that these mistreated specimens bear, but they come alive in these photographs. And so much of her work is a work really of contingency, where she's catching something at a very specific moment in time. Typically, and for the most part, particularly after this moment, she's photographing only with natural light. So these are things that cannot be duplicated or replicated. She's photographing something that we think of as eternal, like museum objects that are meant to be protected and stored away and last forever. Um, she's taking them out of that protective enclosure uh, and then photographing them, bringing them to light. And then in her, by bringing them back into light, they are reanimated and captured sort of in a permanent state of reanimation in her photographs. Of course, they go always go back to the drawers in the same condition they were when they were removed, but they have undergone some kind of transformation through Rosamond's lens. Um, and that's a, a, an incredible um, magical quality to her work. I mentioned her work with three-dimensional uh, materials, and it was always really important for me um, 
if we were doing a proper retrospective to not simply prioritize her photographic work, but to show the full span. And of course her practice includes writing, it includes um, assemblage, collage, of course, photography. She's done installation. It is a varied practice. Um, she's best known for her photographs. And of course, that's the bulk of the show. But those photographs and the three-dimensional objects are so interrelated that to have one over the other would be really doing a disservice. So this is a reverse painted checkerboard that she came across. And then she kept the black squares more or less intact. And then she started to insert these faces. And some are photographs. You can see uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, you can see a photograph of a hanging gorilla skin that um, is almost in the center square that she took a photograph of hanging uh, in a window backlit in the Natural History Museum. And then that became this sort of, she creates this vocabulary of, of hanging figures and ties that into World War I. And the associations are really endless, but she's drawing on all kinds of sources here. Um, and again, by placing these faces next to these black Void, almost voids, you start to read faces in the black squares where she's conditioning you to think in a certain way and to think in a way that's associative. And it's that associative thinking that is so powerful in her work. And if you dwell enough in Rosamond's work, you start, you really can't help but take on her way of seeing and her way of perceiving the world, which is not a world where we, as we look at, we tend to um, and as we think, we we tend to break down the world because the world is such a, you know, to we cannot grasp the complexities of, of our world. And so in order to understand the world, we break it down into categorization of think, thinking of, you know, scientific categorization. But we also break it down into disciplines. We think of science, we think of art, and we think of them as kind of mutually exclusive, things that don't speak to each other. And it's Rosman's work where, in Rosman's work, she's not really interested in talking to other photographers or engaging with photo history, although she does. She's more interested in taking disparate, which they're only disparate because humans have uh, artificially made these distinctions between art and nature and art and science. And she takes these things that are so far apart, you know, in buildings, even you think of the, you know, you think of natural history collections and you think of art museums, they don't often share the same space, but she's bringing them together, collapsing them and forcing them to talk to each other. Um, and, in, in, and in that spirit of kind of cross culture, uh, you know, interdisciplinary thought, she began working with Stephen Jay Gould in uh, the 1980s. And uh, Stephen Jay Gould is, is one of the most famous um, scientists of the last uh, 100 or so years, was a very famous uh, evolutionary paleontologist and thinker and, and excellent writer. And they came from two different ends of the, of the world. And he spoke with a scientific lens, through, or he saw through a scientific lens and she saw through an artistic or aesthetic lens, but they were able to collaborate where she would go out into the field and take photographs of specimens. And then he, she would present them to him. And if he was inspired by something in the photograph, he would write about it. And so she was getting making photographs, not because she was assigned by Stephen to take photographs of you know, this dinosaur or that chameleon, but instead she found things that were vis visually arresting. And then he sort of was able to read or translate those images into another language, into a scientific language. And they added that collaboration, which went on for about 17 years and resulted in over three publications and you know, long running columns in different scientific uh, journals, um, that was an extraordinarily generative relationship that lent her this sort of credibility um, in the scientific world that she had lacked prior. And she's not interested, and they're, they weren't interested in taking the sort of bland natural history photographs that you might see in a textbook, where you have a specimen with a ruler or a dime to show scale. She's actually playing with scale. Sorry, back going back to this image, you see thing, you know, a tiny chameleon that's presented at the same scale as a, as a massive Dimitrodon. And she wants you to look at the teeth. If you look at the teeth of the um, Dimitrodon, which are so present in this amazing streak of red in the stone or the plaster, I don't know exactly what it is, stone, I think, that looks almost like blood. And then you see the blood red injected and uh, the, the skeleton that has been injected with dye, this vascular system that is this bright red. And you look at the tiny, tiny teeth, and you see the tiny, tiny teeth of the chameleon next to the gigantic teeth of the Dimitrodon. It's, it's quite remarkable. 
Um, and so a lot of the time she wasn't arranging things with certain scientific concepts in mind. So this is uh, this photograph of the same moths she thought was visually appealing, which it is. Um, but Stephen looked at it as as a as a way um, as a form of adaptation of, of defensive adaptation and of camouflage, where um, this Samia moth had developed this um, black dot on its wing in order to distract predators from its vital organs. Um, so you see this kind of camouflage on the on the left, and then a, another form of camouflage. Although this is a purely imagined camouflage, where she's looking at these beautiful oak leaf butterflies and putting them against this patinaed metal surface. And they perfect, it's almost as though this butterfly adapted alongside this piece of metal to perfectly uh, match it. And again, this issue of contingency, where this is a photograph of a piranha, a very specific piranha. These are very particular specimens. She doesn't take photographs typically, although we'll see a few, of things that emphasize the kind of overwhelming scale of places like natural history museums, she instead likes to take out and sort of individualize specimens. So this is one open mouth piranha that is kind of swimming in this murky uh, preservative liquid, uh, looking like it might try to swim right out of this jar. And we see that it is very much contained within a jar, but we see this gridded ceiling or window that is superimposed and almost melds with the scales of the fish. Um, but again, this is something Rosman took at a specific point in time with specific light effects. And she went within the last five years to try to find this piranha, but because the liquid had been removed and re replaced with uh, formalin and the specimens had been jostled, she'll never be able to find this piranha again. So this piranha exists only in photograph. I mean, it still exists, but it's in a completely different context and one that can never be replicated. Um, this is uh, two more really great natural history photographs. Um, she's really, you know, if you think about these in terms of abstraction, she's really interested in color and shape. You see this great black and white patterning of the zebra with the ridges of the of the, the skeletal remains of a zebra. And you see the incredible teeth that almost look like Matisse sort of fronds um, in a Matisse painting um, that have been, and those are caused by, and Rosman photographed them because of their um, shape, but this is a, a result of adaptation and, and this crab eater seal or lobodon adapted these teeth in order to sift krill, which is their primary uh, source of food. And she's also um, a, you know, a master of, of mixing backgrounds and, and objects. So people think that this fish, the trunk fish, which is in a trunk, so again, humor, there's humor here. Um, people think that this is sort of um, a transfer of the pattern, that this fish was sitting so long in this box that the ink from whatever lining the box had imprinted, which is not possible because you would really need water. It was not like they put this in when the fish was wet and let it dry. The fish wasn't even in this box. The turtle was in the box, but Rosman saw this fish with this distinct pattern on it and thought that the turtle didn't really make sense in the box, but the fish did and took this really incredible photograph. That's one of her most iconic. And here she is working at the Naturalis Biodiversity Center. So she started off working at Harvard and was really stayed um, pretty loyal to Harvard, um, but then she started to expand and through her connections with Stephen Jay Gould, gained entrance in her own track record of producing really interesting work, ha gained access into the back rooms of natural history museums around the world. And she particularly worked very extensively in the Netherlands. So this is um, in Leiden, and she did an entire series of extinct and endangered species with them. So this wonderful Norfolk Island Kururu, which is a type of New Zealand pigeon. This is one of two, the final two uh, living examples that were caught and and um, mounts and stuffed and, and put into the Leiden collection. And here you have this um, bird that's almost dive bombing it into this um, box. And again, this is shot with natural light. She would bring velvet with her when she traveled across uh, the Atlantic. But other than that, she doesn't manipulate the scene. She will kind of conjure things using light that, um, that give incredible power to the images. More images from the Extinct and Endangered uh, Species book. 
they tell great, I mean, they're incredibly rich in terms of scientific fact as well. The Lord Howe thrush and Lord Howe white eyes were two bird species on a remote island off the coast of Australia that were absolutely decimated when um, an abandoned ship washed ashore. And with the abandoned ship came all of the rats on the ship. And the rats bred because there were no uh, natural predators in these, this very delicate ecosystem and decimated the local bird population. So here you have these three precious specimens that are completely surrounded by these rats that, um, you know, literally wipe them off the face of the earth. And then you have these two quails, um, one that's quite literally in a glass box, and then looking at the other on the left with the specter of the glass box. Again, she'll bring these objects out and they'll momentarily regain agency or freedom, but they always return to their containers. And speaking of containers and um, collections, she's a collector herself. Her father was a collector. And she's fascinated by the sort of psychological um, characteristics of collectors and the obsessiveness of collectors. She did a series uh, called a book called Finders Keepers with Stephen Jay Gould and went around the world uh, capturing photographs of objects collected by several notable collectors. And one of them was Peter the Great. Um, so this beautifully presented collection of molars is really quite horrifying. It's very elegantly presented and you can see it has embossed leather letters. Those uh, numbers rather, those numbers correspond to a register. So again, the sort of the apparatus of museums and this documentation and the administrative responsibilities um, that you have in museums of documenting and collecting, keeping lists. But he's keeping lists of teeth that he pulled from various um, peasants basically. And he would encounter them and, and would decide that they had interesting teeth. And it was often um, listed by profession. So I think number six is an opera singer's tooth. So he kept such detailed records of something that is really quite horrifying. And you don't want to ever encounter someone who considers themselves an amateur dentist. It brings back marathon man kind of vibes. Um, and then on the right, you have a uh, kind of the other end of the spectrum where someone who couldn't control themselves, um, and, but which Peter the Great really couldn't, but didn't have the sort of organizational skills that the people under uh, Peter the Great's employ had, where this is a man, Van Hearn, who was a 20th century collector who collected voraciously and without discipline, really. Um, so these are uh, flattened moles. He would often send moles to people through the mail. He would flatten them. Um, and um, they're arranged with these amazing kind of starbursts, or, or as one reviewer called Jazz Hands, which I like more. Um, and again, it's this symphony of texture, of color, um, and this overwhelming kind of impact of, of what someone, one person can accumulate if they have the sort of requisite mental instability to become a collector. And I say that as a collector and someone who works with collection. Um, here we have two different eyes. Um, the left is a preserved child's hand holding the vascular tissue of an eye. And this is a beautifully, but also disturbing, again, preserved hand that was um, that dates back to the 1600s. There was a, a, a doctor um, who, in, in the Netherlands, who formulated a way to really beautifully preserve specimens. So it's here next to this eye that was in the collection of Peter the Great. And it's an eye that's made out of uh, glass and antler and metal, and it really tricks the eye. And again, in looking at the pupil um, uh, of the of the of the artificial eye, you see the reflection of the surrounding gallery in the window. So again, natural light never really trying to make it seem as though these are anything other than objects and collections, but then working within those constraints to draw out content and 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 incredible um, emotional um, uh, qualities. This is a great photograph of the uncurated jar from the same man who owned the uh, moles. Here, he just sort of threw everything in a jar. And this would be an overwhelming kind of grotesque thing to most people. But through Rosamond's eyes, she sees this as the Garden of Eden. And you have the snake and the apple and then the animal kingdom underneath. She's very interested, as I mentioned, in museums. And I realize I'm probably going to go over time. So don't hesitate to drop out if you want to. Uh, but if you, I'm, I can. I'll keep going. So um, this is a construction that we actually have in the show. Um, and I just want you to keep this in mind, this sort of single point perspective, recession into space, the overwhelming quality of the specimens displayed. Of course, these are um, 
this was actually a, a decorative um, Last Supper scene that Rosamond that had little like plaster figures of the Last Supper in it. And Rosamond, you know, took those out and then thought of it as a as this kind of um, perspective draw a uh, sculpture of a of a museum collection. So it's paired or very close to this large scale in the show, large scale replica of this famous engraving of the collection of uh, Ole Vorm, who was a Danish natural scientist and really quite cutting edge scientist uh, in general for his day. Um, and he had a, a teaching collection in his, in his home and he would collect natural history specimens that would be you know, brought to the Netherlands around the world really as the product of Dutch colonial um, enterprises. And he would arrange them in terms of categorization. And a lot of this is quite quaint and out of date by today's standards. But this was the cutting edge of science uh, at the time. Um, and Rosman saw this over the years and was so really arrest, found this image to be so arresting that um, when she had the opportunity to, to, to do a major show, which at the Santa Monica uh, Museum of Art, which is now the um, ICA Los Angeles, um, she jumped at the opportunity to re reproduce the um, artistic re reproduction of Ole Vorm's Cadmere of Curiosities. So again, there's this translation that goes on throughout her work of um, science being translated into art, then that kind of scientific illustration being translated into three-dimensional art, um, where she's worked for so long, um, collapsing three-dimensional objects into two-dimensional space. But in this exercise, she's taking something that's two-dimensional and exploding it into space. And it took her years to find the really exact um, uh, stand-ins for the specimens depicted in the um, engraving. And this it is a remarkable work of art. Uh, and unfortunately, the physical um, room. This is a 12 by 12 foot room that she constructed and, and had things fabricated and borrowed from museums. And um, it lives in Denmark, which is the right place for it. But we didn't, we didn't borrow it for the exhibition because I think just bringing that to this country would have uh, blown our entire budget. Uh, but we have the, these great images side by side so people can appreciate this amazing uh, effort and, and incredible installation. And here you get a sense of its scale. Uh, and here it is on view um, at the Natural History Museum in Copenhagen, where it was on permanent display. They're doing renovations now, but hopefully it will be back on view. Um, and that leads us to another kind of collection, and that's the collection of um, William Buckminster, or Billy Buck, uh, as he was called affectionately, of Owl's Head, Maine. And this is um, a this is a photograph of his aluminum um, scrap pile. And he presided over a 13 acre junkyard in Owl's Head, which is a town known for its lighthouse and being this kind of picturesque coastal New England town with a working harbor. Um, but he was, he really kind of challenged that uh, uh, picture, post, picture postcard uh, view by kind of being the proprietor of this massive junkyard where he had as I mentioned, 13 acres of metal, of books, of ceramics, of anything you could imagine, often buried underground. Um, here you have a photograph of Rosamond working in this scrap pile, wearing gloves, thank God, and you see Billy Buck on the right. Uh, and they became in great friends because Billy was running a business and everything was for sale, or almost everything. Um, he would, um, if Rosman wanted to buy pieces of scrap metal, he would look at the Wall Street Journal and figure out what, you know, copper was trading at that day. And so he was very disciplined in his own way. Of course, this is a completely overwhelming and undisciplined environment. But he, again, as a collector, as a proprietor of this business, had his own system of organization and kind of knew where everything was, as hard as that is to believe. But Rosamond began to encounter these objects. And she first, as you mentioned, came across this junkyard when she was teaching a workshop at Maine Media Workshops. Um, and she was on her way to the lighthouse with students and they came across this junkyard. And one of her students actually dug up this incredible object, which is called the book nest. And the photograph, this photograph of the book nest as, uh, as well as the actual book nest, both are on view in the exhibition. And this is a book called Flying Hostesses of the Sky or of the Air um, that was buried underground and was buried underground for such a long time that mice or some other rodents 
had eaten into it and made it into a nest. And I think if if this doesn't, you know, is if this isn't emblematic of Rosman's practice, there isn't really any single image that is perhaps more so, um, where you have this great, you know, the great product of man, the written word, the ability to transmit knowledge over time through books, um, the kind of thing that sets us apart from the, from apes. Here you have uh, this, you know, marvel of technology buried underneath and transformed into a house uh, by rodents. Um, so really, uh, the humbling of man in one image, but also this totemic object that really gets at a lot of what Rosman interrogates in her work. She found other objects, and we have hundreds of objects from Owl's Head just on display in the in the gallery. There's an entire gallery dedicated just to the Owl's Head project, um, and I really, really, really recommend that you come and see these in person. You have on the left this this uh, typewriter that's transformed into what Rosman sees as some sort of deep sea echinoid, and then you have stones that look like books. Um, she's really interested in in this phrase that Minor White. Um, originated um, where she's looking at things for what else they can be um, and she's looking at things for what else they are um, and so here you have this array of sheet metal that could have easily gone into a scrap heap but because she has this incredible eye for aesthetics and for color and texture she started to hammer these sheets of metal onto the wall of her studio and now has created uh, a, what is a 20, 20 foot wide wall of scrap metal that reads almost as an abstract painting. But when you get up close, you notice all of these fragments of, of metal. Most of it was from various ships. Um, and the there's paint color, but then there's also natural patina. So again, this transformation of, uh, of man-made objects through natural forces, where things that are man-made and meant at one point to be uniform, when they're subjected to nature, they gain this sort of individuality where you might have three fire extinguishers that all went in the same way into the junkyard, but were when they were uh, dislodged, each one looks completely different because nature, the salt, the the water, uh, you know, air has ravaged it or transformed it in its own way. So. Um, some great detail shots of the wall. And then again, these books, these are uh, water damaged and oftentimes buried books, things that cannot be read, cannot, you know, their purpose is no longer served, but they have been transformed into these sculptural objects. Um, and it's really through Rosamond's careful curation of her own collection of, of ruined or transformed objects from Al's head that they become art, uh, which is another really interesting dynamic in her work. So moving right along, we have um, an array of dice um, and thinking about um, how man-made objects, you know, we, we think of things or we want to think of things as indestructible or unchanging. But when you subject things, either through inherent vice, like these dice being made of a highly volatile um, material, nitrocellulose, um, or by, you know, natural forces, um, man-made objects, you know, what we make is not, nothing we make will last forever. Everything crumbles. And it's, and it's ultimately, you know, it's, it's ultimately hopeful because in that crumbling and that lack of, you know, lack of adherence to its original purpose, something new can, can come through and art can come out of things that are destroyed and decayed. So these are dice that would have been used in casinos, probably in the forties, fifties, made out of nitrocellulose, which is highly volatile. And, and once it starts degrading, it degrades very rapidly. And these were all in the collections, collection of Ricky Jay, another one of Rosman's collaborators. And she's had collaborators throughout her career that have, have really, um, influenced her practice and she's likewise influenced them. Ricky Jay was a, a really wonderful friend to Rosamond and was a famous magician, had this collection of decaying dice, called Rosamond up one day and I think she was on the next flight out to Los Angeles to photograph these dice, which you can actually see uh, some of them at the uh, Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles. Um, so again, this gallery that we're in now um, deals with anomalies. So we have dice, these things that we expect to see one way that have been transformed into things that in some cases look like food, something so far removed from what we expect it to be. And she's playing with that same idea with her photographs of anomalous uh, 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 natural objects. So we have this skull that has this incredible curvature um, 
Of course, it's due to you know a horrible kind of scoliosis-like condition, but she's presented it in a way where it's this beautiful sculptural object next to these deformed eggs. So the def the beauty of deformity, the beauty of the irregular, of things that we typically hide away because our society doesn't like to see things that don't conform to an idealized uh, kind of mold, where she's bringing these things out of the shadows not presenting them in a way that is exploitative, but presenting them as things that are worthy of being looked at, of studied and appreciated and being appreciated. So this is truly on its surface, a horrific image of a, of a, a skeleton of a child with hydrocephalus, which is a condition where uh, liquid builds on the brain and it prevents your, uh, the, you know, skull flaps from closing together. So, but in Rosman's photograph, you can almost see it as the skull is opening up toward the sun, like almost a tulip drinking in the sunlight. And this specimen that is meant to conjure horror becomes something of beauty. And ultimately there's some sort of hopeful quality to this work um, where there is, there is, there can, we can find beauty in the things that we, uh, we st store away or, or wish not to see. I'm getting close to the end. So thank you for bearing with me. As you can see, this is uh, 50 years of work, hard to distill into an hour. Um, the next project that I'll talk about is a is one that seems on the surface to be totally an outlier, which is a series on Shakespeare. Um, and this, but I'll explain how it's really not. Um, Rosamond was invited by her friend, the Shakespeare scholar, Mike Whitmore, to do a collaborative project on Shakespeare. And she said no, because she didn't want to photograph humans. And she definitely didn't want to photograph actors doing Shakespeare plays. Um, but she started to work with these mercury glass bottles, which were used um, in Southern textile mills to store dyes. And they're um, color fast, light sealed. So they're not transparent or translucent. They're opaque. They're mirrored, purely, truly mirrored surface. And she figured out that by standing in front of it or placing objects in front of it, the reflection would be distorted in incredible ways. Um, so she figured out that she create these very enigmatic images that could conjure Shakespeare. And that, again, process of speaking across disciplines where she's collaborating with someone from a completely different field than her own. And he's looking at these images and reading them through the lens of someone who knows every line of every uh, of every play that Shakespeare wrote and matching these sometimes totally abstract images to Shakespeare. But if you think about Rosamond's practice and the interest in ambiguity and distortion and thinking about what she was doing with mylar and also with glass and the optical effects of glass, this is very much in line with her, everything that she has held dear and, and has worked with uh, and 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 um, really pioneered throughout her, her career. So I would I would urge you to think, especially if you come to see the show, at, at how these things all interrelate. And sometimes they're quite obvious, but other times they might need a little bit of teasing out. This is a, um, a, an art that nature makes. Um, because she's shooting into a mirror, and these are not digitally manipulated, it's, there's a lot of um, trial and error. She took, you know, for every one photograph that was successful, she probably took five that were unsuccessful. Um, but since she's photographing into a mirror, the issue of herself being in the photograph really came into, into play. And in some, she's able to disguise herself completely um, by hiding in pockets, because each bottle is different. The surface we think of you know mirrors as uniform, but this is a mirror, you, not a mirror uniformly mirrored surface. They have pock marks and dark spots that you could hide in. Um, but here in this photograph, which is actually created using garlic scapes, what you see as the ground, those are actually garlic scapes positioned in front of the um, in front of the uh, bottle. So she's photographing reflections, um, and then you see this, what looks like a pink sun, that's actually Rosamond in the photograph. That's all that remains of the artist in this photograph. So again, and also you might think, how does this relate to Shakespeare? But in Shakespearean, in the Shakespearean era, when the world was still very much a world of enchantment and wonder, anamorphic images were really interesting to them. You know, things that tricked the eye, fooled the eye, um, were really interesting um, and prevalent in the Renaissance. And you think of the Holbein portrait of the ambassadors uh, with the skull that's distorted and kind of uh, comes together when you look at it from a certain angle, I would put that these photographs in, in sort of that same vein. Uh, 
Second to last category is egg and nest. Um, and this is a commission. So Rosman has also done a number of commission projects, but um, even though she takes on these commissions, she makes them her own. Um, so she was commissioned by Harvard University Press to do a book um, on the collection of the Western Foundation of Vertebrate Zoology, which is a major ornithological collection in Camarillo, California. And so she became really interested in the Muir eggs. And the Muir is a, a type of um, Arctic bird that lays, it, when it lays its eggs, um, when as the egg passes through the, I don't know if birds have birth canals, but what whatever you know orifice the egg comes out of, there are capillaries um, that shoot these distinctive patterns um, on the egg, and each pattern is unique, and it allows the bird, and they're all laying their eggs on these rocks, and allows the bird thousands of eggs allows the bird from the sky to identify which egg belongs to that specific bird. And so they almost act as this biological inkjet printer, um, which is something that really interested Rosman and Dennis, her husband. And they both, you know, Rosman had this idea of unrolling the egg. And what if you could see a th 360 degrees all at once? And so, um, and, and how could you, you know, tease out this incredible patterning? So Rosman and Dennis figured out a way to basically position the egg on a lazy Susan, for lack of a better term, and take these kind of slivers, photographic slivers, which Dennis then pasted together in Photoshop and created these Mercator projection-like composite images that give you um, this amazing sense of, of the artistry of these birds. Of course, they're not thinking about it in those terms, and we're, we're imposing our own Western concepts of art and abstract expressionism in particular onto these birds uh, who clearly don't know any different Maybe they do, who knows? Um, but uh, again, remarkable, inventive work. And, and just beautiful. I mean, there's so much beauty in Rosman's work. Um, and I think we, in today's day, if, if it's not political, nobody wants in museums, if it's not politically engaged work, nobody wants to, to care about it. Um, and there are certainly political elements to Rosman's work. And, but there is at the same time as there's all this substance, there's incredible beauty. and I hope people don't lose track of that. So our final section brings us up more or less to the present in Rosman's career. Um, and there was, she received a major commission uh, around uh, 2010 to do a, um, a co collections catalog for the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University in Philadelphia, which is uh, the oldest natural history museum in the United States, continuously operating. And so she was able to, kind of go through the collections and figure out things that, you know, met the needs of, of the authors and the publishers of things that were distinctive of the, uh, about the collection, but photograph them in a way that was completely her own. And so she was able to take a lot of these specimens up onto the roof of the academy. So this is actually a photograph uh, taken on the roof in natural light. You know, the first thing, first time these specimens have probably seen or experienced fresh air and sunlight in hundreds of years in some cases. So she's taking them up, shooting only in natural light. And she's also really interested in things that look, you know, th seeing things for what else they could be or are. And so this looks to me like a bird's wing, but is actually a piece of hematite, which is a mineral. Um, and this was uncovered in a mine in Cumberland, England. And it's just, and it's the cover of our book because it's so, you think you know what it is, but again, you don't know what it is until you you read and and engage with it. Um, again, she she's a master of color of texture. Um, I love this juxtaposition of these incredibly important bird specimens. And if you see a red tag, that means it's a type specimen, which is sort of the holy grail. This is deemed worthy of being sort of the specimen by which all other specimens of this particular species is are judged. So this is like the perfect, the creme de la creme of this particular bird. But thinking about the abstracting that and, and thinking about the abstract qualities of this photograph, which, you know, the primary colors dominating this photograph, and then this trunk, which has um, these stripes on it and looking at this, the rectangular um, outline of the tag, and then this, the rectangular outline of the of the stripe and, and drawing these connections. And that's really what Rosamond's work invites you to do is to draw these connections. Connections that she makes, but then also she leaves room for people to make their own connections. And she doesn't really 
um, force her interpretation of her work on the viewer. She gives them enough context, but again, she is interested in how people in interact with her work. Um, this is not how this uh, flounder skeleton, you know, skeleton is presented, but she saw this amazing marbled uh, board on a book and then saw this amazing pattern of these delicate, uh, um, you know, uh, fish bones and thought that the juxtaposition of diagonals and vertical lines would be so visually appealing. And, and of course it is. Um, she's also tenacious. This is um, and stubborn. This is a collection of insects um, collected by Titian Ramsey Peel, uh, and from, dating to the 19th century. And, and it's now the glass has never been changed. So it's 19th century glass, which is very reflective and and distorted in many cases. So she's here. She's um, she was kind of told that she was never going to get this photograph by the collections manager. And she has a great line where she says that the photograph proved them wrong because she got the shot. If she finds something that she wants to figure to photograph, she will figure out how to photograph it. Because in her mind, she's kind of salvaging these things that people will not have the opportunity to see. The vast majority of people will never go to the museums that she goes to and photographs. But by photographing them, she is able to share these amazing treasures that she encounters. And she doesn't want these things that she talks about to slip back down the well, to remain unseen for generations. So she sees herself really as this kind of interpreter or liaison between these different worlds. Um, and she, uh, you know, is also referencing art history. This is a really remarkable photograph uh, of various actual wax fruit that's part of a collection, this man named George Loudon, who's an Anglo-Dutch collector of 19th century scientific instruments and teaching tools. And she did a, a book um, with him of his collection. Um, and here, you know, things that are posed very in a very straightforward way. There's a certain refinement and elegance, particularly as Rosmond has um, has entered into her, you know, mature career that um, is really quite breathtaking. And we end the show with this quote, um, which is referencing a quote by Mary Anning, the famed female fossil hunter um, in Lyme Regis in England, where she where she talks again about this issue of contingency and of of chance and luck. And she's thinking of the tides and she was constantly up against the tide where she was up against these natural forces where she had un, you know, dislodged a dinosaur bone or something, but the tide could easily come, bury it or take it out to sea and it would never be seen again. So we end with this quote from Rosman where she says, the animals don't move, but the light moves. The best light is brief and the collection manager is often rustling in the wings. The tide warns me, vita brevis, sweet life. And we end with this photograph of a Lammergeier in the collection of the Elsie Bates Museum in Hinckley, uh, Maine, um, that has this very elegiac quality to it. And then finally, just plugging the book, the show closes in two weeks. We're hoping, we'll see if it might potentially travel to other venues. Um, but the book lives on. Books are eternal, even if they're uh, damaged by being buried in a junkyard in Maine. They last, they can last forever. Um, and so I urge you to, um, to purchase the book, find the book in your local library, ideally purchase it from the Addison, uh, and not from Amazon, but you know what? I really don't care where you buy it. Just buy it, get the book. Um, uh, and with that, I thank you so much for sticking with me and I'm more than happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, I definitely would encourage everyone, if you're inspired by the images that we saw today, to definitely go and look at the exhibit in person. Um, I know that scrap metal wall, you can just look at that for, you know, hours and hours and see different things. Um, so many pieces that really are, are really inspiring if you get a chance to look at them. Um, we have lots of, you know, thank yous and things <laughs> in the chat. Um, one question that came to mind for me um, is so, you know, she's so focused uh, on like, you know, bringing sort of hidden things out from behind museum collections and bringing them to the forefront. The museums, was there a benefit to the museums for letting her take these? Hmm. pictures of their collections or were I know there was some 
conflict and, you know, she had really had to fight to get in there. Um, but were they able to use these to either inspire people, draw them in or? Yeah, um, definitely. So some of these were commissions by museums, but what I found um, really amazing uh, is one, and this is going to sound pretentious. When I was in Spain on a courier trip, I went to um, the Museum of Natural History in, in Madrid, and she did a major installation there, which is actually still on view, although, of course, she's not credited anywhere for it. Um, but um, she um, did this installation of the Royal Cabinet of Curiosities at this museum. And the curator who was there when she did this almost 30 years ago now is still there and I was able to speak with her. And what really um, was so moving about it is she talks about how her time just working with Rosamond changed her entire career and the way that she approached science. And I think that Ro Rosamond brings empathy, she brings uh, beauty, you know, people are used to encountering, they they see things with blinders on in scientific environments where these specimens are not meant to be seen through an aesthetic lens. They're meant to be seen as data points, basically. Mm -hmm. But what can happen if you expand your, the way that you think about specimens and think about scientific collections? What kind of, you know, how can we make maybe our, our world a more, you know, hopeful uh, place, a place that is centered or is embraces beauty and celebrates beauty, even in things that are not meant to be beautiful. Um, so there, I think there's a incredible impact that she's had on scientists um, and on museums and how museums present their collections. And she's opened the door for a lot of these museums to work with artists like, you know, Mark Dion and James Prosak. Um, and I think that's just added a, a new dimension and, and, kind of expanded the field in a really powerful, significant way. Absolutely. She has such a fascinating way of looking at the world and certainly in inspired many people with the way that she's uh, evolved throughout her career. So this this has been wonderful. Thank you. Um, th thank you again. This is great. And again, go, go see the exhibit before it uh, leaves town. We're so lucky to have the Addison right here in Andover. And again, Gordon, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. See you up here at the Addison. <laughs> right. Bye. Bye.